All right. Sounds all good. I'm, for the first time ever, guys, I'm actually not going to read a script. I'm just going to go ahead and tell you guys. So welcome to DI Radio. The podcast that I run that I'm totally not even remembering the script of what I wrote of the introduction. But my name is Vance. Thank you, guys. This is, this is currently recording number. This should be episode eight or seven at the time of this recording, guys. Um, of course, you guys don't know me. You guys, you guys have been tuning in. I'm, I'm Vance underscore XE. You guys may recognize me from MSM or, of course, this show here, DI Radio. Today, I brought in a very special guest, a very pretty cool friend of mine here, Charles Thorne. I almost said your tag, because I know you changed your tag recently. Right, yeah. yeah. I mean, <laughs> a lot of people, this is probably the most frequently asked question for me, but I don't mind if people call me from my previous tag. I just, the main reason why I changed my tag from Korean to, like, just my name, and my name is actually, I just kind of got that idea from Pokemon. I noticed that all the Pokemon players and stuff, they don't have tags, they just use their first and last name, so I was like, well... That's just simple. Moving forward for me, I'm getting a little older, and I just wanted a like more professional tag because it can just be a little awkward when someone calls me Korean and we're not at a Smash tournament, right? Like we're eating out in public or something, and it's just like, oh well, that's just a race of people, you know what I mean? So that those like situations can be weird, and I I also want the option to go into other esports without having, I guess, like an awkward tag or something. You know what I mean? I yeah, I, yeah, I know yeah, it's yeah, not yeah. awkward within the Smash community, but going elsewhere it can be. No, I, I totally get you. I think that was the one thing I told myself when I first started. I was like, I want... My first tag was straight out of Xbox 360 days. It was like... I think it was like Antihero 13 with like Roman numerals. And I was like, yeah, this isn't going to last me for the rest of my life. I'm just changing this into Vance. And that way, if anybody ever just needs to call me by my name, because there's two... My, my real name my middle is my middle name is Christopher. So I'm like, too many people in this world have that name. Just call me Vance. It works. So I, and then not only that, like... If I ever told myself, if for some reason I ever transition to other esports in the future, then yeah, I already have a pretty simple tag. And if you look at some of the other commentators too, like I think about like only a few of them, like for example, like Sagem, he just uses like his name there, Sagem, Tasty Steve, and a couple of other ones like that, just name off the top of my head. Um, people call, just call him James Chen nowadays, so right, right. pretty good idea. But in case nobody, I mean, I'm not wearing the TSM hat. I know a lot of, if you guys watched like several episodes, I wore my TSM hat because I had a terrible hair, but it was also the only hat I actually like. Um, okay, fair enough, fair enough. Let's <laughs> yeah, let's go TSM. So at the time of this recording, I know they made it into Worlds. I don't know the world schedule, so please don't flame me. I'm sorry. Like, I just know they made it into Worlds, and I was pretty happy to hear that. I enjoy watching TSM on the Valorant side, if you guys know me personally, but... Charles, for those who don't know you, and I'd be surprised if nobody knows who you are, but hey, there's a few people in the world who may not know. Go ahead and give me your elevator pitch. So I'm the coach. I'm the Smash coach for TSM, and I also am a commentator for the Smash community. Um, I, I'm trying to commentate other games as well. It's just a little harder to kind of get your foot in the door. But um, I commentated a Fall Guys tournament with EE, like the Keemstar one that's like a charity event. So I'm... Um, I'm trying to go into other games, but I'm mainly known for just my Smash commentary. Um, I did like top eight to a bunch of events and stuff like that. So yeah, um, I used to be a competitor, and now I'm like a coach commentator for Ultimate. Started coaching in Smash Four, started competing in Brawl, and yeah, now here I am now, just uh, still trucking along. And I mean, right now everything's not the greatest with no offline events, but I think the Smash community is making do. That's kind of like the most jarring thing about the Smash community currently. It's like it's just making do. I, a lot of people, I get like different, uh, different voices from different angles. Where some people tell me like, "Oh, you know, it's it's gonna be fine," and then I hear other people like, "Oh, it's dead." And I'm like, oh, "I don't, think, I don't it's, think it's dead." Yeah, I'm like, "I don't think it's dead in the water. It feels like it's like it's dying, or maybe someone's trying to put a pillow over it, but like it feels fine." Uh, I kind of want to talk to you a little bit. We'll get into that in just a second. I do want to talk to you about like trying to transition into learning other games and then being part of other games but before i get to that i kind of want to start off with uh, the beginning of you right um i've okay. known you for about god you've been here I've, it's crazy you've been here for longer than than i've known you yeah but you've been here like for what feels like almost forever it feels like you've been here forever but in reality yeah it's been a short time and i kind of want to like the question i ask everybody is who bought you the Game Boy? You know, who bought you the GameCube? What was life like growing up for you? You know, we all, for those of you guys who don't know, Charles from Hawaii. You know, you guys both came from Hawaii, a scene that I that a lot of people just didn't, I wouldn't say respect, but just wasn't really well known at the time in Smash 4. 
I remember, I like, I'm, I'm pretty, I'm really bad about this because I wasn't really around in Brawl. I just know that everybody told me, hey, there was this thing GSM. They had like all these cool combo videos, um, and I was like, oh, hey, right, cool. So they're from Hawaii. GSM got it. Tell me the beginning. I, I kind of want to hear the beginning of this. All right. So I mean, my dad was the one who just got me like Nintendo games. My favorite series, uh, Pokemon. I played a lot, a lot. Um, I, I, my mom like owned a construction company, so she would have me like work a lot on like summer vacations and stuff. But then um, I would get to see my dad on the weekends, so that's mainly when I would get to like play games and kind of like escape from whatever, you know, you know, like the classic like escape from whatever BS you're dealing with in real life. You know, play a video game and have fun. Um, like I said, mainly Pokemon titles. I was I just love Pokemon a lot. I just played so many of the early Pokemon games, and I mean, just even, like, Nintendo games in general. Um, then the N64 came out. That was, like, so amazing. That Probably to this day, my favorite system. In terms of, like, obviously, it's not, like, just the titles and what they meant to me and the experience that I got from the N64 was just so godlike. And then I fell in love with Smash Bros. the first time I played it. Just played it all the time. And... So I, I definitely played casually N64, like early, you know, when it first came out. I didn't think there was a competitive scene. Maybe there was, I'm not too sure. And then Melee came out on the GameCube. Still just played that game casually. I never got into Melee competitively. Um, I love watching it, like, yeah. at the moment, but I never got into competitively. So played that um, casually for just a still super addicted to that. And then it kind of, like... I probably it was probably melee melee to me is the best smash game even like in almost every aspect when you look at it competitively it's like so hype even like on a casual level you look at that game and it was so stacked it was like the first time the events came out the adventure mode was fun like everything of the collecting the trophies were really cool and melee is the title that made me really just fall in love with smash and smash from from melee onward, Smash was my favorite series, like period, like game series. Mm -hmm. So I, that's where I really, really just fell in love with Smash Brothers as just like a casual player. And then Brawl came out, and I was in high school. I was like in ninth or tenth grade when Brawl came out, and uh, yeah, I just started getting into it competitively, and you know, really just started going to all the Hawaii tournaments, and um, I got PR'd in my region, and it was just, it was really fun. It was a really fun experience, um, and that's where I kind of joined the GSM crew, and GSM kind of, like, dominated Hawaii Smash, but we played very different. Um, a lot of people's experience with competitive brawl is very uh, not so fun, just because, <laughs> like, Meta Knight was very oppressive. Ice Climbers were, like, very lame, just because you, it, was, it was just a very defensive game, and it was... The disadvantage wasn't too crazy unless, you know, you were, like, Meta Knight edgeguarding somebody. But, like, past that, uh, it was a very neutral base game. And that's why even if you watch, like, Brawl players play, like, Ultimate or Smash 4, they play very neutral. Like, you can tell. You can tell, essentially. Yeah. So, so yeah. Um, I w and being in Hawaii as a high schooler, especially in Brawl, like, the biggest tournament was, like, maybe a couple hundred people. You're competing for some couple hundred bucks or whatever like n none of us had the resources to fly out but dark musician who's pretty much like the main to of you know the brawl scene and then going forward the smash for an ultimate scene he still is the head to he would fly players over so um i got to meet larry that's how i met larry for the first time and um actually like our best player was actually pretty good uh he took larry to game five at one of like the grand final sets and that was the weekend before Larry won Apex 2010. Who, I, so, like, I'm, like I said, I'm really bad at Brawl. Like, Brawl was the game, for the, like, just a little bit of myself. I, I'm with you. I played most of the games casually. I, did, I played, you know, 64 casually. I played Melee casually. I, very much like you, Melee was where I started to figure out, hey, I love this game. This game was great. I actually tell people in the fighting game space, I contribute Melee to be very much akin to Street Fighter 2. That's what starts everything. Me the, the competitive right, systems right. that were in Street Fighter 2 and then the competitive systems in Melee went on to define the genre. So, but I, who was the best player in Hawaii at the time? I, I'm, like I said, I'm really bad at this. So I don't really know. Um, the best player in Hawaii for the pretty much the entire lifespan of Brawl was Lethal Trilogy, like by a, lar by a large margin. He was our best player. Who, who did he and name? He, 
Uh, Meta Knight. I okay. mean, his, Meta Knight was his best character, but he could play all the top tiers, and mm -hmm. he would like rotate top tiers like on everyone. Like he was, he was a very clear cut the best character, mm -hmm. or not best player, best player in Hawaii. Um, and he was able to take Larry to like he was actually up two one in the set, and then Larry won game five. But that was literally, um, the weekend before Larry won Apex. So just to like, I mean, you can't you can't say like, oh, you know. Lethal Trilogy would have got top 8 if we went to Apex or whatever, but we weren't horrible at the game. Like, a lot of people would watch our tournaments, and, like, we Hawaii would play very, like, aggressive because we just didn't camp super hard. That's mm -hmm. just something we didn't do, and we didn't have, like, a really, really strong, like, Ice Climber main, and, like, we just didn't do, like, the super timeout strategies. Like, we just wanted to fight each other, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that wasn't necessarily how the meta was on the mainland, but that's just how we played. But that didn't mean that our players were like bad. At least, like, we had at least one legit player, and that was our best player. But still, I mean, for being secluded on an island with like no resources, that's it's pretty good. And I don't think Hawaii lacked in terms of talent, right? Like even no, like I, Boyd, I, Hawaii. like I agree. there was talented players. It's just the the main thing that sucks about living in Hawaii and trying to compete is the resources, right? Like if you want to go to a saga or just some big tournament you have to at least spend five hundred dollars on a round trip plane ticket and then get a hotel and do all that stuff right so that alone is just like well do you have that much money to sink in and what do you get back for it you know what i'm saying like yeah. you have to pretty much just like pop pop off and just be a top player and even then flying back and forth like you'd have to get a sponsor to pay for that would they want to pay for that like there, mm -hmm. there's so many factors going into it it's just it's really hard to live in Hawaii and be like a professional player. Yeah, I haven't really kept too much. If you guys want to know, I think I'm pretty sure this is the actual. It's the Odo faction for Twitch.tv. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's for you, all those of you guys wondering like, we're gonna keep up with the scene. I know like one of their best players. The last time I kept up, I think it was like Small Left, who was like one of the up and coming players. He, He's currently the best ultimate player. Yeah. Yeah. So like it's and I. I think he got a few upsets at Genesis Seven. I can't remember. I like feels like forever yeah. ago. But I had the ch I had the chance to meet him. And yeah, they told me like whenever they do come to Ho for, and whenever anybody majority from Hawaii, I think the only person I ever met that traveled solo was Dren, because he came to a few of the sagas. Right, he was able to stay with you guys, and but like he told me um, what Small Left and his crew was basically telling me is like whenever we travel, we try to travel in a group to save and spend as much as the cost because yeah, the cost from traveling. From an island to mainland adds up a lot, and especially when you're traveling to a place like Oakland, even in general, it could it could add up a lot too. So I think yeah, those re I think that's kind of the beauty about living in SoCal that I tell people is like most of the esports scene, if not all of it, is actually located here in California. If not in Southern California, then you have Northern California, and all that other stuff. So how did really quick just to backtrack a little bit, how did you join G uh, GSM? And what was that like to join the crew? So the way it worked in Hawaii for Brawl, it was like everyone repped their city. Like, so I was from Waianae, which is like all the way on the west side. And then next to Waianae, there was Kapolei, which is the crew GSM was from. Then there was Eva Beach and there was uh, Pearl City, all the people from town. Like it was, it was based off of city um, where all the crews were. And in the very beginning, like every city essentially had a crew, but Eventually, I was the only one left from my city that like kept like wanting to play the game because GSM dominated the scene. Like, just no one could beat them. Like, it was like the top three-ish players were all GSM kind of deal. Like at every single tournament, so they they just dominated the scene. And I I wanted to beat them, but the the rest of like the rest of my crew like from my city just kind of lost the drive to play they were kind of just getting over it right and i would like take the bus by myself i was like dude you know f this i'm going like i'm gonna go to the tournament whether or not like, you know so i just kept going and eventually i was just like well i need people to like practice with um i i'm close i live close to them so i asked to join and then i got accepted to join gsm so then it, gsm turned more into like a hawaii crew because other people from other cities would like join in and then we just became a group of friends and we just played a lot of brawl together we just grinded that and we made combo videos that was probably the funnest part about gsm was uh just going over to lethal trilogy's house and playing a bunch and you know 
making combos and all that jazz. So that that to me, those are like memories that I'll cherish for the rest of my life because that was like the funnest part about being on the crew was just making sick combo videos. Lisa Trilogy was a really creative editor, especially like if you go back and watch those videos, like it for the time that it came out, it's pretty amazing. Like the editing's pretty amazing and it, it aged decently well. So um, I thought those combo videos were ahead of its time and it was just cool because we would combo, we would do crazy combos and like the SD combos that were like this, you shouldn't technically go for that in tournament, but like you just super disrespect someone and like you kill your own stock to destroy theirs. Like it was just super cool. Uh, like that's just <laughs> how we played and we thought it was super tight. So, and I mean, those videos have like a crazy, if you go and look on YouTube, Gimp Style Madness and look at the Brawl combo videos, they have a crap ton of views. It's, it's insane. I think that's the... The, um, I would say the history of almost every major esports team, it was like a crew of people who had passion for the game, who made video combo videos, or in this case, montages, and that evolved into something. I am like, at the time of this recording, I'm trying to work on my own content in its own fashion. And I've learned that, oh, well, I think the number one, like, obviously, everybody knows about it, like, FaZe Clan, they started off as like, hey, we do trick shots, this is our videos on, on Call of Duty, right? This is how we're doing it, this is how it goes, and then they rose up to be, you know, Call of Duty superstars. And then a lot of esports teams had that drive to make combo videos, and then they became something. I think what's the most interesting for me, I mean, I call, I, it's, it's an unofficial term, but I, what I like to call is the esports pyramid of greatness. And Smash, is the, um, Smash and the fighting games are kind of at the very bottom just due to the lack of money that's put into the scene and because it's primarily grassroots versus something like League at the very top that you get to have, like, imagine Dragons play at uh, Worlds or something. Right, right. Have, like, a VR dragon, like, come out of the crowd exactly. or whatever. Like, crazy <laughs> editing. And, yeah, you, you just... In terms of the developer support, it's just you can tell the developers are fully supporting the game and backing the game mm. like competitive, right? Because when you look at all the other, you know, some of the other these other games that aren't so up there, I, I won't say it's the only issue, but one of the biggest reasons why is because the developers, and by no means is like any developer obligated to support the competitive scene, right? To the amount that League does, but that's just how League brands their game, right? This is a big part of the branding and all that jazz, so. Um, but for, you know, these other games, their main goal and what they pour all the resources in is, like, they need to sell X amount of copies. Like, they, the more they sell, the more money they make. So that's what they focus on, obviously. So, yeah, I mean, and there's nothing wrong with that, but that's just how it is. Yeah, and I've, I've never met Dark Musician. I've heard a lot of great things about him. So I think what's really, what's kind of like his legacy from what I've seen in my perspective is he has created a very, very, I think the best way I can sum it up is a very beautiful thing in terms of, the name GSM has such a history with, like you said, right? It's those combo videos with a lot of amount of views, but it's also a product that has shown with players like you, Void, himself and being such a great TO. I'm, I apologize, you know, GSM Hawaii, because I don't remember the name of the tournament. I know what it's, it's a, it's at a convention or something that I know there's a tournament. Hawaii happening. Con. Hawaii Con. Hawaii yeah, Con Hawaii Con. Hawaii Con. It, Koi Con's an anime convention that happens every year, and it's been our biggest tournament for since Brawl. So yeah. all the biggest Brawl tournaments, all the biggest um, Smash 4 tournaments, Ultimate tournaments, obviously the numbers get inflated because it's an anime convention. So you have a lot more people that just enter the tournament, but they don't go to Koi Con because of the Smash tournament. They go to Koi Con because it's an anime convention. But so a lot of you have a lot of casual entrance, which is just good, right? Like that's why it's our biggest tournament. But yeah, it's definitely inflated in that sense and i mean dark musician honestly is the father in my opinion of the current smash community like so i mean obviously there's a melee community and then the, the current smash game community right that's how i kind of view it because the brawl community transfers over to smash 4 which transfers over to ultimate nobody like stays back and plays those games so the way i look at just smash communities in every region or just in general there's the melee community and then there's the old or the current smash game community right and they definitely intertwine like some players play both and all that jazz but yeah dark musician is definitely the father of the current smash community in hawaii like the current smash game community so uh he taught me how to play the game i remember my senior project i did it on competitive gaming and he was like my mentor and we we met up at this land center and he taught me how to like di he taught me like 
what Smash competitive Smash was. I knew nothing about competitive Smash. I just knew like, oh, the C stick is Smash attacks, and like this is up here, this is there. That's all I knew. So he taught me how to play the game in a competitive manner, and yeah, and even from there, like he helped so much people in the scene grow. He, you know, hosted the tournaments. He's the main TO, so like we wouldn't have the competitive scene without the tournaments. He streamed the tournaments and all that stuff. So I mean, really, the only reason why any thing smash, Hawaii Smash, you know, related in terms of like the current Smash games from Brawl to Ultimate is because of him. And I, I'm very grateful to him. He he would pay out of his own pocket to like fly players like Larry Lur out and stuff like that. And this is back in Brawl when like, you know, there's like actually no money, like in terms of like, <laughs> you just, have, everything's out of your own pocket, right? So, you know, he, he really sunk a lot of his own personal resources into the Hawaii Smash scene, which is just, I'm super grateful from the bottom of my heart. And it, it trickles down, right? So, you know, he teaches me the game and then, you know, play, people like me will help other players and teach them the game and help players like Void out. It all, it all like trickles down from the top. And, you know, it's, it's a, a he's really a humongous reason why anything Hawaii Smash related ever got out of Hawaii and into, you know, the mainland or the real world, so to speak, yeah. and keeps going. And he still, he, he coaches small left right now, the, uh, the current best player in Hawaii. So he definitely, he definitely puts everything into the Hawaii Smash scene. And I think that's kind of like, and I wish him well. I want to have him on the show at one point or another, because this is probably one of the most interesting stories I've ever heard coming from you. But I've always, I sort in my in my aspect, in my view, right, I see this as kind of like his legacy is what small left is. His legacy is what you've become, and his legacy has become where Void has gone, right? Like you said, things trickle down, right? That level of skill that he took the time to teach you the systems of the game and all that. And then eventually you would go on to teach Void, and then eventually you would come out to grow on your own. I think that's sort of like the big, if I, if I view it that way, it's the bigger legacy of like, I created these two, even more, you know, the, the Hawaii Smash team, but I've also created these two very great players who have come out of Hawaii. And, yeah, I, I definitely would love to have them on the show at some point. But I kind of want to, like, kind of go back a little bit here. So you, the Hawaii Smash team started to grow. You started to grow. And then things start to come out for you guys to come out as players. And I kind of want to dive back into you a little bit just because I, I remember one very good – Interesting memory of when, can't remember, I want to say maybe 2018, 2017, so I apologize if I was wrong. We went to the movie theaters. We went to El Capitan in okay. Hollywood for a hat. And I remember yeah. we all went to go see Incredibles 2. And like, oh, it was me, you, Strides, Dren. <laughs> I'm really sorry. I think it was, I forgot his name, the Roy main. I feel so bad that I'm forgetting him right now. Oh. Uh, God. It happened, man. You can't remember. Lightspeed. Everything. Lightspeed. There you go. I was like, God. There you go. Yeah, Lightspeed. There you go. And then we went, to, we paid for the movie tickets, right? Cool. We all decided to hang out before we went to Hollywood Action Tuesdays that day. And the cool thing that I that shocked me was you asked for military discounts. I, in my mind, I was like, none of us are serving oh, the military. Yeah. And then you served in the military. Right, right. Yeah. So hearing so, that, yeah. So go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Tell me about that. Yeah, this is uh so I mean, you know, gonna fast forward past Brawl. Actually no, I I joined the military during Brawl. Yeah. T so, yeah, I mean, tell after, them, tell them. so after high school it's like it was tough for me because I mean, you know, the dream is like, oh, I wanna be like a pro gamer, blah 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 blah, right? So but it's like back then, you know, I'm twenty nine at the moment. So I graduated in oh nine, so oh nine it's like there's stuff going on like MLG, but I mean, I didn't play those games. I mean, I played StarCraft and when StarCraft 2 came out, I got like the, on the initial like release, like the first season, I got the highest rank you could get, which was like currently Diamond. So that was like the highest rank you could get. And I was that, so I was like pretty good at StarCraft. So I was thinking about going into that, but it was such a, it's such a reach, right? So I'm, I'm thinking to myself, I'm like, okay, well, I could try to do this, but like, is it gonna work out? Or I don't, and I'm, I'm like 18 or 19. I really don't know what I want to do with my life, right? Like, no one really, or most people don't really know what they want to do with their life when they're 18 or 19. So, um, I was still working construction with my mom, just you know, playing StarCraft, playing Smash, and I, I was just like, well, and my friend told me about you know the Army National Guard, so I was like, okay, well, I will try doing that and i can get paid like the way i thought about it is like i can get paid to learn a profession right so 
Um, I took the test. I could like do every job except like maybe one or something like that. But I was like, okay, I'm gonna try out medic, right? So I was like, it's it's funny because my thought process behind it was like, I you know I play support in League of Legends. I I was a healer all of World of Warcraft. I was like, all right, I'm gonna try to be like IRL support. I'm gonna try and be a medic, right, and see if I like it. So I tried it. Um, I did six years, and I I did enjoy it. But I, it was not something I wanted to like fully commit to. I, it's not something I was like, oh, I'm gonna go to school after this and you know go more into you know, like first responder stuff. I'm gonna go. And I didn't want to like go for my paramedics because I got, I got my EMTB, but um, I didn't. It wasn't something that interested me that much. So yeah, I, like and towards the end of the six years, that's where I really like Smash Four came out during. Uh, I started hanging out with Void. So Void, it's funny because Void actually found out about GSM through the combo videos. And he was like, wow, these combo videos are sick. Where are these guys from? And he was like, oh, wait, they're they're from Hawaii. All right, well, what city are they from? Oh, snap, they're in Kapolei. And then he was going to Kapolei High School at the time. Like, just pure coincidence. So he meets Lethal Trilogy at school. They start talking about Brawl. They start playing. And then Lethal Trilogy is like, oh, hey, there's this... There's this kid from my high school, and I actually think he has mad potential. Like, I think he's not really good now, but I think he has, like, really good potential to be really good at the game. And it's just funny because the first time I played Void, it was in a tournament. And I was, like, kind of sandbagging. I was, like, not super tryharding, and he took game one from me. I was like, oh, wow, all right. Like, I was like, this guy just mashes. He's trash. Mm -hmm. And I was definitely, like, not a very nice person back then. <laughs> so and then I beat him game two and three, and I tell these trailers like, yeah, yeah, he's he's pretty bad. Like I don't think he could ever be good at the game. Like that was like that's how my outlook on Void was when I first met him in Brawl. And like I said, I was a very different person back then. I was very like super ego. Thought I was like the shits. You know what I mean? Like nah, <laughs> but I wasn't. But like, but yeah. So eventually, me and Void get close through playing League. We started playing League together. Um, he was really good at the game, and essentially he was teaching me how to be, like, not trash at the game. So we grew, like, really close through League, but it's just funny on, like, when we first met each other, he didn't even really have any, like, bad feelings about me, but I was just a, I was just a dick, so. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I'm glad Void was able to look past that, and we were able to grow really close through League of Legends, and then Smash 4 dropped, and that's when me and Void were like, well, we're going to go hard in Smash 4. We're going to go super, super hard. And even right when the game dropped, he was he was really good at the game, right when the game first came out. And I was like, well, yeah, I mean, he's he's going to... Because, like, he, w he got pretty good at Brawl, but we had such a huge lead on him, like most of the experienced players. Like, Void started playing competitive Brawl when Meta Knight was banned. So, like, oh, yeah, and then that's... later on, Meta Knight got unbanned, and he had no Meta Knight experience. So, like, every time I would play him in tourney, I would just grind him out, and I will go Meta Knight. Just because I'm like, you don't know this matchup. And then I would <laughs> I'd only go Meta Knight on Void, though. Everyone else, I would not go Meta Knight. But, <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, so I, I'm, I tell Void, you know, I'm going to fully commit to coaching him. You know, I still want to be a player and stuff. But, and, like, the plan was eventually possibly move to SoCal, right? Um so I was kind of getting towards the end of my six years on the mil with the military, and I was just like, I don't know, I can't resign if I'm going all into esports. And that was probably the biggest crossroad in my life was like when I had to resign for the military after I served my six years, because if the only option for me to resign was to resign another six, and if I do another six, I'm pretty much committing that that's going to be 12 years. I'm going to go all the way and yeah do the 20 years if i do 12 right so that was probably the biggest decision of my life where it was kind of like i was like am i going to try this esports thing or am i going to take the consistent route and know take this route that i know will work right and in terms of life decisions i try not to take too many crazy risks but i just for me i was like i don't want to i don't want to like look back on life and just be like well i could have maybe gone for this there's a little chance like what if or what would have happened right so i was like you know what i will i will won't resign and at, at by the time i was getting towards the end of my six years void has already moved to socal right mm -hmm. and i i wanted to move with void to socal but my ex-wife at the time we were together and she didn't want to move right so i i was like okay well i'm not i won't move and then towards the end of my you know six years uh she decided like okay well I'm down to move to California and give it a try. So with that, I was like, all right, so I could move to California. I wouldn't resign with the guard, with the army. And 
I'm going to give this like two years. I'm going to move to SoCal, give it like a year or two, see where it's going. And if it's not looking good, I'll probably just move back, try to rejoin with the military and work construction with my mom. That was like my backup plan because mm -hmm. I've done construction. By the time I was, to give you guys a perspective, um, by the time I was 19, I helped my mom build five houses from the ground up. Like from the ground up, I, hel I helped my mom build five houses and like i said every like summer break or winter break, any school break i'd be working like five or six days a week with her um i would get like maybe one or two days off to spend time with my dad and that's mainly when i would be playing video games and stuff um your dad like your dad sounds like sorry really quick your dad sounds like the gamer of the family and then your mom sounds like uh, i'm gonna raise you by the book Here, here's the construction yes. yeah my mom <laughs> My mom is the Korean. She uh, she's a hundred percent Korean, so I'm I'm half, mm -hmm. and she was very strict, very very strict, anger issues, you know the standard stuff. Um, and then my dad is so I'm half Swedish and then half Korean. So my oh, dad, okay. I didn't know that. Swedish. My mom's Korean. Uh, my dad was very chill. He pretty much let me do whatever I want, and he would like if I wanted like a game, he would get it for me, kind of mm -hmm. deal. So. Uh, my dad, like, spoiled me, but then my mom was, like, polar opposite. She would, like, make me buy my school uniforms. She she would take, like, she she would, like, she worked, like, I would work for her when I was a kid, and she would, like, give me, like, 10 bucks a day, which is, I don't know, probably illegal, but whatever, <laughs> right? Like, and yeah. then she wouldn't even give me the money. She would, like, hold on to it, and she'd be like, ah, well, you know, you have to buy your school uniforms, and, you know, that cost this much, so it, I took it out of your thing. And I'm like, oh. Okay. Yeah. Like, <laughs> so it was kind of like that. It was. I, I had. I had the extremes of both worlds. Okay. Of deal. And then like you know, I'd go see my dad, and he'd be like, "Oh, you want this Nintendo 64, and you want this game, and I'll buy you these cars, or you know, he, he would like just outright just ridiculously spoil me. So yeah, it was. It was definitely extremes of both. I, I, like I, interesting. I kind of want to say like something about me that I, you know, I'm not trying to make this about me at all, but like one thing that I do tell people, I procrastinate a lot of my things for, just in general i felt like that taught you the ethics of like hard work and then putting in work because i've always told people and we'll get to that like in a little while but i always tell people uh charles is somebody who like he knows how to put in work if he has to if he's chilling he's chilling right. but he knows when it's time to put in the work and that's something yeah. that i feel like i've slowly learned like forcing myself into that but i feel like yeah Definitely hearing you say it definitely has uh, proven my point. It's like, yeah, you, your mom taught you, like, the hard ethics of, like, hey, this is how a job is done. This is what you need to do to work. This is the value of your dollar. And then your dad was very much like, hey, man, relax. You know, you know, there are times when you can relax. Play a video game. Chill, you know. And then you can go back to work. Um, but, yeah, let's go, let's go back to what you were talking about. At the end of your six-year service, that was the crossroad, right? Right, right. Essentially, that was a very big deal. And you, you know, even when I think about in terms of work ethic, yeah, my mom is pretty much the sole reason why I have that work ethic. And as a kid, I, I wasn't very, I didn't like it much. I said a lot of mean things to her. But, you know, looking back on it as an adult, I very much so appreciate it because I, I just have that work ethic. And even like when I look at other people and how they have like, you know, look at other people's work ethic, I, I kind of look at myself and I'm like, oh, okay. Like my work ethic is a definitely above average kind of deal. Yeah. You know what I mean? But, um, yeah, like, when I had to make that decision, it was, uh, like, Void was already living in SoCal, so it was going to definitely help with the transition phase. Um, we we're going <laughs> to move in together. There he is. Because when, when, Void, when Void moved out there, it was a lot bigger risk. That's why I kind of wanted to move out with him. But, you know, at the end of the day, everything worked out. Mm. But it was definitely a bigger risk for him than it was for me when I moved there. Because Void was already there. He was already, like, you know, established with CLG and all that stuff. And he had, like, a very good income. And it was, it was enough for uh, – and he was able to, like, scout out rental places. Like, he was the one that, like, went to the places that – I was looking for while I was in Hawaii and he like looked at the place, did like a little video tour, send us pictures or whatnot. And that was a big help for us. And that was like, that was pretty much the plan. And I pretty much, I decided like, Hey, like I said, I'm going to give this like a year or two, give it an honest shot and see where it goes. Right. And if I'm going to move anywhere, it's going to be SoCal because especially uh, like we moved in right when like sagas were, you know, popping off, right? So, like, I knew for a fact at least every month 
I'd be able to go to a saga at least bare minimum, right? And then there's MSM was popping off, all the Wednesday night fights, all the locals were popping off. So we wanted to make sure that we moved right next to the esports arena. Um, we were like a five minute drive away from the esports arena, the apartment. We when we rented this small little like two bedroom, uh, one bathroom apartment, really really small, but we we could afford it, right? And yeah, I mean right when we moved to SoCal, that was that was it. That's when it was like boots on ground. I was like, all right, I'm going all in. I am like going to every single local. Like so much. One of the most common things that a lot of people ask me, like, oh, how do I improve my commentary? You know what I mean? Like, da -da -da. I'm like, you just you just have to like a big. Obviously, I can critique people's commentary, but like a really huge part of it is just you have to go out there and just grind. Like my commentary became what it is today because I was going to like. I'm not even lying, like, five, at bare minimum, five locals a week. I was going to say, you went to, like, everything, dude. <laughs> Literally everything. And I, in Smash 4, I definitely, I still competed. Like, I wouldn't say I was, like, PGR material in Smash 4, but I could definitely take sets off of PGR players in turn. Like, that's what my level was. Not at a consistent level, but I was, like, pretty good at the game. No, so, yeah. so, and, like, obviously, I... I that helped me like coach and all that stuff. So I was still coaching Void at the time. I was competing. Um, I would, you know, lose at a tournament, get on the mic, commentate the rest. Super salty, but you, you know, you gotta like just swallow the salt and then get on the mic, throw in the smile, and commentate. And that's that's what I did at least five days a week. And that's not even counting if there was tournaments on the weekends, if there's like a saga or something. And that's where you know I definitely started. I guess networking within the Smash like the SoCal Smash 4 community because coming from the Hawaii community, everything's close-knit. Everyone knows each other. Like, if I go to a local in Hawaii and there's someone that I don't notice and, like, there's a new face, I'm going to walk up to that person and be like, oh, hey, welcome. How are you doing? Like, how'd you find out about the tournament? Blah, blah, blah. Like, there's a lot of way more one-on-one -on -one interaction. And since the scene's not as big, it's essentially just a big group of friends, right? So it's like, if we have, you know, 30 people at a tournament, that's pretty good. 40 people, whoa, this is crazy. Like, 40 is like an outrageous number for a Hawaii tournament, right? Usually like average is 20 to 30, you know, back when I competed over there. But yeah, I mean, SoCal is a much different vibe. You are not going to know half the people there yeah, for the most part, right? Like if that, um, obviously there's going to be the regulars and all that stuff, but it's a very different environment. It's de definitely something I had to get acclimated to, get used to. Um, it was a lot more competitive in SoCal, like, you know, people are more willing to like time you out or grime you or whatever, right? Um, so that's definitely something I had to get used to. And I mean, it was really cool just meeting everyone, like getting to know 2GG, you know, and just, and I was also working a marketing job at the time too. So I'd just work during the day, night tournament, come back home, sleep, and then just rinse, repeat, rinse, repeat. Um, it was a grind. It was a hell of a grind. Uh, obviously it was super worth it. Um, eventually I was able to get on to 2GG and, um, I, I, I still remember to this day the first, like, saga. I, it was, like, West Side Saga I commentated mm -hmm. at. And I was, like, super nervous. I was like, oh, man, this is, like, a saga I'm commenting. And it was, like, pools of a saga or something. It wasn't even anything crazy. <laughs> but uh, it to me, like, I still always just, like, cherish that memory. And, you know, from there, just, I just kept trying to improve on my commentary and improve coaching and just try to learn as much as I can about the game and absorb as much information as I could, try to like kind of develop my commentary style, work on all of my weaknesses and all those areas as well. And yeah, I mean, everything definitely worked out. It really kind of sucked when we hit that phase in Smash 4 where Ultimate was announced. But so like no one gave a crap about Smash 4 for like, you know, the six or eight months we were waiting for Ultimate. So that, I remember the 12 man Wednesday night fights and stuff. Oh, and yeah. even during that time, everyone was just like, well, screw this. I, I get, I have a break from Smash, right? So I'm just going to play another game and then when ultimate comes out i'm going hard right but for me i was just like well i'm still i still have to practice like i have to you know get my commentary better and you know even like just playing the game smash more your fundamentals would just like get better and all that jazz so i still went to every single local i could during that like famine period of smash 4 and that helped my commentary a lot too because i could be a lot more experimental because there's not much viewers and stuff so i could work on the things that i wasn't i like sometimes i'll go to locals and be like okay i am not going to allow myself to talk about any frame data or like 
any like analytical stuff. I'm just solely going to work on like, you know, being like high energy and uppity because like I felt at the time that was like my weakness. And obviously, like even now, like the stronger part of my uh, commentary is analytical stuff. But I do try to make my content like more digestible. Right. And that's something that going to those locals and experimenting with like really helped my commentary out a lot in terms of like coming you know, later on, I was able, I feel like, especially in Smash, or even in FGC, Smash and FGC, like, there's not crazy amount of resource, right? So, like, with these bigger games, they, you know, they just pay more, and then there's, like, specific rules. Like, they're like, okay, we're pairing you with this person because you're the color commentator, and then, you know what I mean? Like, they have all the roles and all that jazz, and then they structure it, right? But, like, for a Smash tournament, for the most part, it's like, well, who do you, who do, you do good with? You yeah, know, like you have to in, if you're a smash or an FGC commentator, you have to be able to fill every role. That's just yeah. like if you can't, then you're extremely, extremely limited. And yeah, it's just a, it's a it's a different game, essentially, in terms of commentary. So that's something that I was really able to develop during like the famine, you know, part of Smash 4. And right when Ultimate kicked off, I was just ready. We were ready. Like I was even doing YouTube content for Smash 4. And even if it didn't get as a, a lot of views, like I still understood like, OK, I, this is how I do the thumbnail. This is how I edit. This is I, I all that stuff was tail end of Smash 4. I forced myself to learn how to do that stuff, and even just in esports in general. And this is going to be like even more so with Smash. You have to be able to wear multiple hats. If you can't, then you're just like you have to be so good at whatever you're trying to do that like you're just that is that going to be the case? You know what I mean? So like I tried really hard commentating. I tried. But I also competed. I also, you know, tried my hand at coaching. I also did video editing. You know what I mean? I also did tournament organizing stuff with 2GG. Like, you have to be able to do all these different things to have, like, the options. And it also helps your networking too, right? Oh, because I TO stuff with 2GG, now I can get possibly better commentary slots and stuff like that, right? Yeah. Like, that's just – and, like, knowing the TOs, they're the ones that make the decision for commentary most of the time right mm -hmm. where they hire someone else to do it but like that's just how it rolls and like being able to wear multiple hats like that is extremely extremely important so i definitely did that grind super hard in smash 4 so when ultimate came out i was editing for void's youtube channel like day one ultimate day one ultimate editing for void's youtube channel and even um i i, I eventually quit my marketing job and and this is mainly like right after me and my ex-wife broke up so that can, happened can, like can I, I just want to and i want to add to that too for just just a little up? bit because i remember when that happened i think we were at a hat it was me you pluto we went to what was it fat sal's we sat down right she told us about it you were pretty bummed out this was like 20 am i, am I wrong 2018 it was like a year it was like within the first year of me living in socal yeah so like I, it was because it was in the first place, the first two bedroom place we like rented out, it was like mm -hmm. almost towards the end of that lease. So probably like eight months ish, eight yeah. or nine months into me living in SoCal. Yeah. And I remember 20, yeah, cause 2018 was the year that Ultimate got announced. It left the landscape barren. Right. Like Smash 4, like whatever Smash 4. People actually tell me the rising arc of Smash 4, the height of Smash 4 was the sagas. That was it. Right. right. Once, it once it got to. Once it got to the Civil War, things slowly went down. It rose up again because of the championship. And then after 2017 into 2018, everything was, like, slow. It was so slow. The famine. The famine. Yeah, it was the famine. And then Ultimate came in, and then it changed things. And then coincidentally, that, that year, I remember you, told, you were telling us you were going through the divorce. But I told, right. I told everything. I think the reason – because people told me, are you going to still – people ask me if I still want to commentate or still show up to tournaments – even then, and I remember the good example that you were, right, as you said, was you still kept going. You did not stop. Right. And I remember you you took that divorce and you took it as, I'm going to work on myself, but I'm also going to work on these things that I never thought that I could be doing or that I should be doing to better myself. And then right. lo and behold, like, you started losing weight because I remember – I may or may not have it. I'm going to shuffle the cards here and sh show everybody. Yeah. <laughs> but, like, you started losing weight. You, I noticed, I told everybody, like, you started improving on, I mean, not that you were very good, but you, I noticed you started improving 
on commentary, you were you were releasing cons and videos. You were still showing up, and I'm just basically right. retelling at this point. Hopefully, everybody can see it. Yeah, that's that's the Charles <laughs> that's Charles Thorin that I knew like back in 2018. Yeah. Yeah, I, uh, but that's just the ghost to show how much you've grown because you never. That's the one thing I told everybody is Charles never stopped grinding, and while everybody was taking that by like, oh, I'm gonna sit down, I'm probably gonna play something else, you know, whatever. You never stopped grinding, and I think that kind of slowly goes back into your work ethic. You just put things back on. You said, now nah, I want to double my efforts this time around. So just wanted to add to that a little bit. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, yeah, and you know it. Obviously, just going through a divorce is going to suck no matter how it happened. And, you know, and on both ends, none of us were perfect. I, you know, it's it's just so rough, right? Like moving, moving from Hawaii is a very hard thing to do. Hawaii is a amazing place to live in. Um, very beautiful. The food's amazing. And even just like all your friends that you grew up with, like leaving that is very tough for anyone, right? Moving anywhere, not that, and that doesn't even apply. Just, that's not a Hawaii exclusive thing. That's just moving in general, right? So... It was very stressful for um, both of us. And at the end of the day, you know, we left on somewhat good terms, you know, and I, for me, I was just like, okay, well now, now I just, I'm going to double down. I'm going to double down, go super hard into Smash. And, you know, and then for me, I think one of the biggest points was when I commentated at the championship saga, like the actual, like the championship, right? Uh, with G pick, that was, that was that block alone gave me so much confidence in like just my commentary i was just like wow that i felt really good about that block and it feels like i'm improving to the point where like i might be able to you know make some money off of commentating possibly go forward right it it was like that it was that block that kind of gave me the confidence to keep pushing forward um obviously i was still pushing forward but like you know what I mean? Just like when you when when that experience happens and you're like, wow, like you start seeing the fruitation of like all the stuff you've been grinding for. Like that was a really big moment for me. So, um, yeah. And then, I mean, just going forward and right when Ultimate dropped, being able to go like super ham. Um, I, I still wanted to compete in Ultimate, but just like the, the game didn't feel as fun to me. And like it, it's just so hard to really keep that drive as mm -hmm. you get older. Um, and even like... Uh, even before Ultimate came out, I started working a welding job so I could... I literally, like, planned, ult like, the very first, like, six months to, like, just the opener of Ultimate, I planned for. Like, when Ultimate got announced, I was like, I need to make more money. So I stopped um, working my marketing job, and I started working uh, a welding job. Because I, with my experience from, you construction. know, working construction and all that stuff, it's definitely different. You're working with metal, but uh, I... I so I started the welding job. It paid pretty well, and I saved up a bunch of money. I was like, I need to have like at least like 3k about saved up. So right when Ultimate drops, I can because you that's the thing, right? Like when Ultimate drops, no one's just gonna get sponsored right off the bat. You have mm -hmm. to have resources to fly out to these events, right? Because you know even for commentary, the only people that especially when Ultimate drops, the only people getting flown out for commentary and paid for it is like you know TKE, Coney, stuff like that, right? Yeah. So. Yeah, I mean, I'm I especially at that time I wasn't gonna get flown out from a TO. Hell no. <laughs> so I have to hope that the TO just lets me commentate. Um, maybe I get some money, and then I have to fly out, you know, um, pay for hotel and all that stuff. Luckily, uh, Void, like when Ultimate came out, I was still coaching Void, obviously, and Void helped me with like the flights, um, even like the first. Like, I would say, like, maybe four months of Ultimate, I was still working my welding job. So, like, to give a perspective on how hard I went when Ultimate dropped, I would work my welding job eight hours, right? Um, you know, commutes maybe, like, an hour, 30 minutes there, 30 minutes back. So that's nine hours of my day. Then I would get back home, shower, do whatever I need to do, eat, go to MSM or whatever tournament's going on that night, compete in it, right? And then, oh, I'm out of the tournament, but I still wanted to play and get better at the game, but I'm like, oh, okay, but I, I still want to do commentary, right? So then I commentate, I, like, I'm spreading my, and I'm, I'm also coaching Void, so, like, I'd get home or whatever, we would go over VODs, we would talk about the game, study the game or whatever. So I'm also coaching Void at the same time. I'm also video editing for Void. So, like, sometimes I'm also like, okay, well, I get home, I'm like, damn, I, this video's got to go up. Boom, edit, make the thumbnail, and, you know, uh, Alpha Rad was a huge help to me. He gave me and Void a lot of advice for the YouTube channel. Definitely wouldn't Void's YouTube channel wouldn't be what it is today if it wasn't for Alpha Rad and what his, like his advice to us was. And then 
then I'm doing that. And then I'm also, you know, commenting at the end of the tournament. Oh, I commentate all the way till grand finals ends and it's two or three in the morning. Go back home, sleep, sleep at like three or something. Right. Wake up at like six 30 in the morning. Go, go back to my willing dome. That was like, there was days like that where I'm getting like three, four hours of sleep. I'm waking up, I'm popping a coffee. I get back home, like pop another coffee. And then like halfway through the tournament when I have to have like a bunch of energy after being so, super salty that I lost to like something I probably don't like about the game and then I have to like pound another Red Bull so I can be super hyped for you know like the top whatever of the tournament that I'm commentating right like yeah. the final stretch of it so that was like an average day for me during like the first like four months of ultimate when I was juggling all those things eventually and the goal was for Void and me to it was to get his YouTube to the point where he could, where it could be my job, essentially. That was mm -hmm. the goal. And he gave me a very generous split, split. Usually you just split it 50 50. You know, the person making the content for with the person like editing and making thumbnails and doing all that. But he gave me a 70 30 split, which is like super generous. And I mean, he's just being a homie at that point, right? So I was able to, you know, drop my welding job after about four ish months um, into Ultimate. Um, I still had that, you know, chunk of money I saved up that I was using for flights and Void was help. And, um, or hotels and stuff and void was helping me out as well um so if i went to the same tournament as void and i was coaching him he would pay for my flight i would stay in his hotel right so he would help me out a lot there and that like that was like his like payment for you know me coaching him mm -hmm. and then he also helped me out with youtube and that was pretty much like the beginning era of ultimate for me and void we were just grinding super super hard yeah i remember i told everybody like even when you think about it, not in a bad way at all, because for those of you guys who don't know, like coaching changed a little bit. The rules of coaching change depending on esport. In esports, depending on what you're playing, it's a little bit different. In most of the fighting games, mid set coaching is banned. From what, I, and I know that like games like Street Fighter, it's also still banned. Um, so there, you can't do that. Back in the day, we used to like be a little bit more allowing of it, but we decided mid set coaching is banned. So I told everybody, in if you think about it, when you fight Void, you're not fighting just Void. You're fighting Void and, at the time, Charles. And you're fighting two people. and Because I remember at the time, uh, at that era, it was me and Nico and the 818. Nico had freed us from the clutches of Mario because Mario used to dominate every 818 local. It was, like, it was super annoying. So Nico came in with his Shulk and he sliced down every Mario to the point that we hadn't seen Zenyu at that time show up to a lot of locals and it was a running joke so i remember me and nico went to a tournament and this is an esa one and he had to fight void grand finals and i think he lost and he, he wasn't beating himself up but he was more of like he like sat down for a moment he wasn't mad or anything he's like i lost the void it's a good loss right right it was close as possible but i told nico because we we went to z fly's apartment and we were just chilling there and i told him if you think about it you have to fight Void and Charles. And then he put down his switch and he goes, oh, damn, you're right. I do have to fight Void and Charles because Charles coaches him to a point that, like, it's almost like you're fighting him both at the same time because of all the things that you've gone through. All, even, though, even if you're not a competitor competitor, you're still playing the game to a point that I tell everybody, out of all the, out of all the commentators in SoCal, the best player, so to speak, is... Charles, because he beats us all like like nothing, you know. I can't get past stock two against you, and Z Fly still has trouble. So I tell people it's crazy because Charles has been not only coaching Void, but he's still like you said. If you wanted to compete, you chose to commentate instead. But I tell people, if Charles were to compete, you could probably still get PR'd. It's just his focus lies elsewhere, and then you can see it in his work and his ethic and his work ethics. So yeah, just go on. I wanted to add to that a little bit. Yeah, yeah, and. It's a, uh, yeah, it, and especially like the it, it changed too, right? Just like mid set coaching. You, I think the mm. last uh, tournament I mid set coached was Arms Saga in Smash Four. That's when you could yeah. like in the middle of the set like sit down with the player and coach. And that that was broken. I remember doing that with Void. Um, but yeah, it's a uh, so like, you know, we're we're kind of in, in terms of the timeline, we're like in the beginning of Ultimate, right? Mm. And um, so I, I, I'm finally able to drop my welding job. I'm full-time editing for Void. We're, you know, doing a bunch of stuff. At that time, I was trying to get onto CLG as Void's coach. And there's a, 
there's a bunch of different things going on and mm -hmm. i remember talking with bam and um it was at uh this was at the f smash con the first smash con okay. right for ultimate and um tweak got third and i was talking with bam and bam was like dude tweak tweak needs a coach he doesn't need a coach but like i think it would help him immensely if he had a coach because you know he's just so good but the the mental part i i wouldn't say it's an issue but sometimes it can spiral like downward out of yeah, control yeah right? i agree um so yeah and i i mean i've been friends with tweak ever since uh what like smash 4 is when i met him in person and tweak actually started playing competitive smash because of the gsm combo videos so definitely um what he it, like he definitely looked up to me in that sense where it's like oh you were part of the crew that like got me into smash like that's that's, that's, that's a crazy cool, circle right? to, to put it around yeah right right um so i definitely i started talking to tweak and was like okay well i mean if if tsm like if your team is interested in having a coach i am not on any team i you know and i i even talked with void about it and he was okay with it because at, at, at the end of the day i was like i i would like to be on cog but if they don't want me i i need to be able i need to at this point i need to get on some kind of tier one team right because i like for me it felt like a ticking time bomb i was like i don't know how big ultimate's going to be for how long right and especially at the very early part in the first year i was like i this is like probably my best opportunity to secure being on a tier one org so um you know talked with gavin about it talked to tweak or tweak about it and uh eventually we yeah i mean eventually i got on tsm and that was probably me getting on TSM is probably like the most like happiest moment of my life. That? I don't know if that sounds like weird, but <laughs> no, it's, no, like, no. for me, it's like my biggest life accomplishment. Like yeah. I'm like, wow, I, you know, came from Waianae, which is like the you know the more ghetto side, or the ghetto part of the island that I lived on. I was like, okay, I was like from the ghetto, from you know this small island of Oahu, you know, in the middle of the ocean, and. I worked really hard and I got to a point where, and it's crazy too, because even when I played League, my favorite team was TSM. So, uh, you know, I played League competitively. Well, I played League like season one starting, but I played it like really competitively like season three, season four. And I was a huge TSM fan. So the fact that I got onto like essentially my favorite, you know, team for esports, I it's just such a happy moment. And like, I got to coach a player like Tweak, who's so talented, mm. has so many options. Um, very challenging to coach because tweak and void are very their strengths lie in very different areas mm -hmm. so um it's really fun for me I, I i love coaching tweak he there's uh it can be stressful in a sense where it's like you have so much options because you can play so many different characters right so it's yeah. like well what character do you go with and which one's worth it in the long run and which one's worth it for now or which one's worth it for x matchup or or you know what i mean like we have to break down in theorycraft so much matchups and even like thinking back on it too, when I started coaching Void in Smash 4, um, I feel like a lot of people think that the black and white way to coach is like, oh, I'm the coach, I know more, like you listen to what I say, right? Mm -hmm. But I, do, I definitely don't think that's the case, especially with Void. Um, when I started coaching Void, that was like the first time I just started coaching in general, right? I kind of was just like, I really want to help you. Um, I guess I'll coach you and I'll also like help you financially and because I have like a job and you're just like Void was just out of high school at the time. Mm -hmm. um, but you the way I view coaching is like I'm learning the game with the person I'm coaching and okay. I want to give them a different perspective on different situations. Even if I agree with like say we talk about a situation and, and I think that they're right, I will pitch a different situation or a different perspective and be like, well, what about this and what about that? And let's break down what like risk reward this is and what risk reward that is and what's like worth it and like do you do this sometimes for mix and stuff like that right so it's it's to me i feel like i'm learning the game with the player i'm coaching and we the main thing that when i'm coaching someone it, like we have to have similar somewhat similar ways of thinking of the game like fundamentally and if there's if that's there then I can pitch a bunch of different perspectives. They can pitch a bunch of different perspectives and we can just learn a lot about the game, right? Obviously, like, I feel like every player, you're you're going to have coaches that work better with certain players, right? Yeah. I do feel like that. I don't think that I'm the best coach. Like, I am 
a coach that is on a tier one org that no other coaches are on a tier one org. So if like you're looking at that perspective, I guess kind of, but mm -hmm. it's more so like what coach works for you as a player. And th that's why I think like different players should try different coaches, see who works for best for them, what kind of, like, cause everyone has different styles, right? Just like how yeah. there's different play styles in Smash, there's different styles of coaching, different and styles I'm, of commentary, right? I'm glad you're saying that too, because uh, for those of you guys watching, if this is your first time watching, ever i had two coaches previously i had is on ramses right and listening to them and talking to them especially ramses i learned a lot even even in like if I'm, I'm not playing the game right oh i am playing the game but like right now we're not really necessarily talking about the game but i'm learning about how their coaching style represents their gameplay style and then i can see the differences you know ramses went to a school he graduated with, with from university right and he learned a lot about the systems of the game because that was his chosen degree of marketing uh not marketing his chosen degree of profession and then with iza he went from con he was coaching and content creation and then that leads back to the and then with you you've coached such star players and like you said right out of all the coaches it may not be the deciding factor that makes oh i'm the best coach right like you said every coach is different for everybody, right? This coach may work better with you, that coach may work better with you. But yeah, I think when I look at all the, I wish, it's very hard to do it, honestly, as you, you guys can all see. But yeah, you're the only coach that's sponsored in a tier one org, and it'll, but it also shows the value of a coach. Because I feel like some players and some people don't necessarily value that in fighting games a lot. But when you see a player like Hungrybox, who even talked about well, how did he get to his big W at Evo that allowed him to break through always being the bridesmaid and never the bride, he even said it was a coach. And if you look about it in Smash, right, what, what could definitely define a player could be that coach, right? So. Right. And some players prefer not to have a coach. Like that's some people or some players, that's their preference. They'll just rather not. Um, and that's completely fine too. Just, it, it's all, it's all preference. It's all just what, what works for you. Cause everyone's different, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. And you can see some players who obviously don't prefer a coach as we can all see here. Honestly, this is, this has been a really regular really conversation. You're also hearing all this information. I, we're not, I'm not ready to wrap it up just yet. I kind of want to go ahead and, Talk a little bit more about you and where you are now and how things are going and where you're going to go. I, I just want to ask you a quick question as a break, kind of like a break question, basically, is what's, what are some other games that you've been looking into to trying to get into? As you mentioned at the start of the show, right, that you're interested in branching out to other games. And I tell people, you know, that's something that I can see you definitely do, right? Especially being right. part of TSM. I've, I've, like everybody who knows me, I've been following Valorant. I love TSM on the Valorant side. I'm not too into League, unfortunately. So I've been following like people like Myth and all those stuff. And he's, you know, been watching the streams as well. But what are some games that you would love to be into, but also interested in being a part of? Um, it's it's so hard, right? Because essentially one of the biggest things is getting into the communities. Uh, you can anyone can play any game, right? But it's like, can you get into the community, get your foot in the door, kind of deal? Um, I, Fall Guys is definitely a game I have a lot of fun with. I've been trying to try and commentate events for that, and you know, um, may, maybe I, I, I've I've done one like Keemstar charity event, commentated that with EE, so that was really fun. So hopefully in the future I'll be able to commentate more of those kind of like Fall Guy events. So that's definitely one of the games um, I'm looking to towards. Uh, I've been playing a lot of like Warzone. Warzone's really fun for me. I don't know if I would like commentate the game. I feel like I could, but then. Like Warzone's a game that I just like play casually, and it's like if the opportunity comes, like oh yeah, I do play that game. I know a decent amount. Like I would do it. Um, and then the other game I'm playing casually right now is League of Legends, just because like Worlds is happening, and I feel like when that happens, like everyone's just trying to grind at the end of the season, get gold, get your skin or whatever, just like play. Um, League is like super hyper competitive. I highly doubt I'll ever do anything within league of legends i think one one thing i'm looking forward to in the horizons is when the uh, riot fighting games comes out i'm gonna go hard in that um yeah. see if maybe make, make something happen there um yeah and even like just anything past that like shooters i'm just bad at or i don't really play too much warzone is just like something i play just with my friends and stuff um so i never i tried valorant but it was it's really really hard game obviously so um like cod is in my opinion easier yeah, it yeah. could be completely wrong, but no, I no, think you're, that's you're... something a, a lot of people agree on. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, Valorant is a game. To me, it's like the Dark Souls of shooters. It's I flick too too little or too much, or I react too slow. 
and I'm I'm done. Versus, or if I if I forget to stop holding W in the middle of a gunfight, it, the difference between COD and Valve, the best way I can explain it to somebody is, Call of Duty is much more freedom to miss your shot. If you miss your shot in Call of Duty, the recoil is a slow rising recoil. That's okay. Like it's very very slow. You can still control it. Right. In Valorant, you get two shots within the same point, but the third or fourth, probably the fourth at this point, because most I think it's about three shots, depending on the gun that you're using. The third or the fourth shot will go here. It won't go this slow ascending here. It's one two here. And then it's like, great, now I have to really adjust my mouse. I have to stop holding W because if I'm still moving and shooting, which a lot of people are used to in shooters, you will miss your shot and you will die and you will get one shot and it's annoying. It's definitely one of those games that like you have to sit down and you have to really teach your system one and your system two to work together. If you, if you guys don't know right, what system right. one and system two are, look into it. There's a lot of videos about that. But you have to stop doing that thing. So I agree. I agree. Uh, going going back to you and learning other games. Yeah, I think finding games is definitely something that I still want to. I could definitely see you doing like Project L. We don't know the game. I'm hoping that with the way that Project L looks like, it looks like it's going to be a fighting game based on within the League of Legends universe. Obviously, right, right. so I'm pr I'm pretty sure they'll probably like. I'm kind of hoping my having my fingers crossed. They'll like they'll have an exhibition match, so to speak, just because it's worlds and they can show off that. It would be the perfect time to show. Project L, I know they right. like talked about it. I think what was it this year or last year where they talked about most of the projects? Um, right, right. So I could definitely see them showing off Project L at like Worlds. I hope they do. But uh, for you, when where you are now and where you want to go, it's pretty amazing to see how far you've come full circle. I, I'm I pretty much we we pretty much reached the end of the discussion, honestly. Um, yeah, yeah. I did, I Unless we want to talk about like current events, like obviously <laughs> that's, that's everything kind of, slowed down and stuff. That, but. That, that's kind of what I want to talk about a little bit because it's been a question I have been like on and off about roughly just because I feel like eh, I don't want to beat a dead horse, but also it's still very important in the zone of it. Uh, mm -hmm. Just because I'm not trying to like, for the record, for anybody who's wondered like, hey, you've asked that question or you don't ask that question. It's not that I don't want to move away from it. It's, it's something that I've accepted, but it's also, like, not necessarily a stressful question, but a question that I sometimes feel like, eh, I'm not that qualified for, but maybe I do want to ask it. But, yeah, let's go ahead and point out the elephant in the room. How do you feel about where Smash kind of was, is, and maybe going as a whole, with given, given with the current events that have happened? Right. So, I mean, COVID pretty much mainly screwed over tos like anyone with a big event they got screwed over the most hands down um i think like players and some commentators got like pretty big buffs in a sense where their streams are popping off so they don't necessarily even have to go to events anymore when they come back you know what i mean they could just keep streaming obviously they probably would but um even like it's it's a weird dynamic because even when a tournament happens, like the players' streams have more way more viewers than the actual tournament stream with the commentators, right? Because player or people have never seen the players' perspective. Like they're not seeing like what their thought process is on picks and bans or maybe off of a certain interaction or maybe they rage or maybe they popped off, but like they get to experience that like even closer, not just like a player cam, right? So I feel like a lot of viewers are kind of gravitating towards that more, which is again, screwing the TOs more, even more over because, <laughs> like, maybe they're not getting subs or donations or w whatever uh, revenue, right? So, um, yeah, it sucks. And I think I think the general viewership goes down, too, just because it's very hard to get in, invested into a, like, Wi-Fi tournament as much as an offline tournament because it's Wi-Fi, right? Um, I By no means am I saying, like, if you get a win on Wi-Fi, it's not as important, but it's definitely not offline. That is factual. You know what I'm saying? Like, at the end of the day, Wi-Fi and offline are different. They are different. Are they different enough to the point where it's, like, totally discredit someone for a Wi-Fi win? No, I don't think that. But at the end of the day, it's a Wi-Fi win, right? Yeah. It's, it's not an offline win. So um, I feel like it's a little harder for players, viewers, and everyone else, even commentators, to, like, get as invested as an offline event. The fact that we have Wi-Fi for this time being, we're blessed, you know? Like, so we can still do stuff. 
But I definitely think when offline things do come back, we're going to get a really big kickoff. Yeah. So I think that is something to look forward to. And we just have to weather the storm, so to speak, right now. Yeah, I, yeah, definitely. It's, I couldn't have said it any better, honestly, if you ask me. I do think that, yeah, as, as of current, like, noticing a lot of, like, I've had a few conversations with a couple of TOs. Um, for those of you guys watching, you guys have already probably heard me in MSM. You guys know, like, if MSM gets, like, at least 200 views, that's already a pop-off. Because, like, obviously a lot of people would rather watch X player stream because that is a different experience and a much more interesting experience that a lot of players never got to really see unless you're there offline and especially hearing them talk. I mean, obviously, if I'm a player and I'm talking and I got hit by something, right, like you said, you might rage, you might say something, or you might talk about that situation, especially. I think that's that has changed the landscape, especially for a lot of players, too. I mean, look at Light. Light's the one player that I told people, he said, oh, we're going online? I'm out. Like, uh, you know, I'm not going to play online as much as you guys might think I will. I will. You know, I'll be playing something else. You know, see you guys when we do come back. Hopefully, fingers crossed, in a year. Um, that has definitely changed things a lot for TOs. I do think, yeah, when we come back offline, for sure, things will pop off again. Because a, a lot of the, you know, Wi-Fi warriors, play, like, I'm not, like, shaming anybody or anything, but a lot of players like Bestness, Epic Gabriel... Sonics, they're going to be like, you know what, it's time to go back to my tournament. I'm not going to stream at home and play online when finally I can break free and go offline. But when I go back online, there's there's a lot of things that we can talk about. When it comes to the situations with the allegations and stuff like that, how did you take it? Um, I've already spoken my piece, but I kind of want to hear your side of it a little bit. It was, it was really stressful. It sucked, right? I mean, it sucks for everyone, but like, I feel like it sucked for it sucked more the more closer you were with the people involved right so i was i was pretty close to some of the people involved and just it sucks because i it sucks because well one it's like mainly it's like well it sucks for the victim right so that that's just going to be disheartening and then on top of that it's just like oh well someone i was close to made that person feel that way because of a mistake they made right so then that also sucks and then you're also like worried like well i don't want my friend or the person i was close to to like hurt themselves over the situation or you know what i'm saying like there, there's so many factors going on that it's it's very overwhelming to take in and when all that happened that was like right before we moved to where we currently are so i'm also like looking for a new place and that's also really stressful. just moving in general is really stressful so it was a bunch of piled up stuff um, I wasn't like really, I wasn't really outspoken about all the things going on on Twitter or social media. I kind of like just turtled up and was just trying to make sure my own mental health and the people around me, like like my roommates and Void and you know all that other stuff. Like I made sure that our mental healths were in check. That was like the most important thing for me. And yeah, I mean, kind of that's how I went about it. Um, as for how I feel, it just it really sucks. But at the end of the day, hopefully we can you know build back up as a community, which I think we've been doing, and kind of like move forward. Um, at the end of the day, I don't think like Smash is just gonna completely fizzle out. It, it's definitely a big hit, you know what I mean. Um, but I think we can regrow from this. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I think. Well, I'm out of questions. I. Definitely, uh, for those of you guys watching, this is at, this is at time of recording is in a different order, but this is currently episode eight. So I, this has pretty been a this has been a pretty big milestone for me, just because you guys already heard I was never able to get past episode five on previous podcasts. So it was like it really hurt me, and I was like, cool. Now that I passed episode six, I'm recording at seven and eight with nine and ten. You know, within the coming week or so, um, I. I guess the only question I will have, because I apologize for, I know you guys, the community may have questions for you. I have just two questions before we close the show. Um, one, what's, huh, I guess it's more, more or less just one question in this case, but we'll see if I can get the other one down. Who would you want from League to be in Project L? Because I, I think if you ask me, I think you, that it's going to be a 2D fighter, right? Yeah, we, yeah, we, I, I, yeah. We I think it's going to be a 2D fighter, right? I, I, okay, yeah, okay. yeah, because they, they've shown off, from what I saw, they showed off more of a 2D fighter space. Because right, I, right. I do know that they bought the developer. 
Yeah, they bought the developers who did Rising Rolling Thunder. Thunder yeah, yeah. Rising Thunder. Yeah, and then they have Seth Killian, who is pretty much an OG like FGC figurehead, and they right, brought right, him right. in to definitely spearhead the game. I think personally, just me, I'm gonna go ahead and say this, and then you can answer. I think you can actually make it pretty well as a commentator in Project L when that comes out. Just because given your background as being part of TSM, a lot of people know TSM and League, Valorant, they're one of the biggest teams out there. I think T if TSM were to grab anybody, if League were to knock on TSM's door and say like, hey, we want commentators for this thing, who do you got? I know a lot of people are looking at Sagem, you know, James Chen, but when you think sure, about right, of course. But when you think about the history of Riot, that falls under things like TSM. I think they choose you knowing your fighting game history. And as my knowledge is one of the only, you know, coaches in fighting games that is part of TSM. Right. So I think they want to see you're the obvious pick in my pick. I hope that gives you some confidence. But who would you pick for Project L? Hey, hmm. I think, uh, so my favorite... My favorite league character that I would want in the game, probably Thresh. I think Thresh would be an interesting character because you'd probably make him play like some kind of mid range, right? Like he mm -hmm. wouldn't be like a super up close, but he would probably play like that kind of mid range, like swordy character because he's got like the chains and all that. I, I think he would just be a really sick character. And like I, I'm just imagining like comboing things into like a death sentence or something would just be super sick. Uh, but yeah, I, I definitely would want Thresh in the game. Okay. And then final question before we close with the show. Probably a question I think the community will honestly ask. What's what's your favorite thing about working with Tweak as a coach? My favorite thing about working with Tweak as a coach? Hmm. How much I've learned from coaching Tweak. I think uh, it's op it's made me a lot better of a coach because I, I coached other people. I did com commission coaching in Smash 4. But, um, I mean, the main person I coached was Void. So... The fact that Tweak had so much different strengths and weaknesses than Void, it was almost polar opposites in almost every category. Um, I learned so much to become a better coach. And I think we, the amount that we both grew from the experience, like obviously we're still, you know, we're still going through it or whatnot, but um, I think me and Tweak grew so much off of each other that that, that feeling just makes me very happy. I think that's my like favorite thing about coaching tweak is just how much we're able to grow off of each other yeah i think one of my personal favorites not involving coaching my personal favorite story was like it was like on twitter you went over to you went over to the east coast to like you know hang out with him visit him and like talk and all that stuff and my favorite thing about it was um he got really into pokemon packs so he bought so many that you were just like you yeah you yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you and b were just stuck like ripping old pokemon packs because looking for something specific i guess yeah yeah, it was. We were opening packs for like anywhere from like two to three hours straight. Jesus. Straight. Like, <laughs> that's how much packs were bought. It was. I've never experienced that ever in my life. And I'm someone that loves TCGs. Mm -hmm. Like, I was super into Yu Gi Oh! Super into Pokemon when I was younger. So the fact that I got to experience it in opening packs for that long straight was that was just tight and i'm 29 and it's still sick right like <laughs> yeah no matter, i feel like no, ma no matter how old i get like opening card packs is still gonna be super fun yeah it was i actually talked about it's the original loot box if you think about it that way right true yeah it's the original gotcha so well with that being said charles thank you so much for being part of the show honestly it's an honor to have you here we've we've hung out before in tournaments we've all like we've, been, we've worked together before shout out to Termin in the background he's been enjoying that space yeah. Um, is there anything you want to say before we close out the show? Uh, actually, just, uh, I know I know you just started streaming and all that stuff, so please dro drop your information. I have, I'm, I actually, I apologize to everybody because I'm on this side, and then you're on that side from what I'm seeing on, what if I'm only looking on OBS. So our tags are reversed. You're where you're <laughs> where you're seeing is saying my Twitter at, and where I'm is is your Twitter at. So I apologize. I mean, you for can probably just edit it. Right? Yeah, I'll probably edit it in post. No big deal. Right, um, right. But yeah, Charles, where can everybody find you? Uh, so my Twitter is at Charles Thorin underscore. So C-H-A-R-L-E-S-T-H-O-R-E-N underscore. And then everything else, um, you can find me on Instagram at Charles Thorin. And on Twitch, you can find me, 
you know, backslash Charles Thorne. So everything's pretty much Charles Thorne, but except my Twitter has an underscore at the end. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, uh, if you are interested, I started streaming like maybe three weeks ago about just got my sub button. So it's pretty hype. Um, so definitely going off and trying that out. Uh, I'm actually having a lot more fun than I thought I would have. So that's really cool. And I mainly just like play with different people and give them advice like it's like a coaching ish kind of stream but like i'm still playing people not just like only bot reviews or whatnot so yeah i have a lot of fun with that and yeah that's that's pretty much it thanks for having me yeah thanks for being on with the show guys we're going to continue on with more diary with more guests coming out uh for sure you guys will already know where to keep a log on you guys can follow me on my twitter at vance underscore exe i kind of i do kind of talk a little bit about di radio i talk a little bit more probably behind the scenes and things that i'm doing but you guys already know the show is on 2G Gaming on the official YouTube. Uh, definitely check out the Twitch. I stream, but I stream whenever I feel like it. I'm working on other things. Especially the show has been more of my main project. Until next time, guys, it has been my pleasure to serve you. Stay, stay safe and be kind to one another. Bye-bye. <laughs>